Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm John Sullivan. I'm the executive director at the Free Software Foundation. Um, thank you. I mean, I, this is such an awesome conference, um, but it's so much fun to speak to so many people and um, talk about free software. So thank, free, thank you for having me here. Um, our goal at the Free Software Foundation is to not just to promote free software or, or to tell people that it's a good thing. Our, our goal is actually to create a world where everything that anybody wants to do on their computer can be done with exclusively free software. So in the FSF's utopia, there actually is no proprietary software, and yet everything still works. <laughs> so that's ultimately what we're aiming for, and I have to emphasize that at the beginning of every presentation because I think it's something that really distinguishes the way that we approach things. Right now we have a problem. Uh, we, for many years, have been working to create a laptop or to bring about a laptop that could be a fully free system, not just the operating system, GNU Linux running on it, but also things like the boot firmware, you know, what used to be the BIOS, what now is a different kind of boot system. And it was that last part that was always the huge obstacle uh, because that type of programming is very difficult and manufacturers are very uncooperative. So just recently, we were finally able to endorse a laptop under our Respects Your Freedom hardware program, which not only runs a fully free operating system, but also has a free boot system. Um, and runs the boot system without loading any binary blobs to power any of the uh, drivers on board. Does sure. the fact that it's a ThinkPad mean that other ThinkPad models are within reach for this? I think so. So uh, you might think that the problem that I was talking about is that this machine is several years old. Um, that's not actually uh, that big of a problem because uh, it is still a workable machine for everything that I do uh, and everything that a lot of people that I know do. You're not going to be able to play 3D games on it, um, but you are able to, at a fine speed, do your email, web browsing, and everyday computing. Um, so this is a huge win for us, and we're excited about it, and we're hoping that the momentum coming from this and the work being done, especially by Coreboot, which is an amazing project uh, to free the boot firmware on servers and laptops and systems, uh, we'll be able to get more of the ThinkPad models running. The current obstacle is that more ThinkPad models are running, but they don't all, uh, some of them still require some proprietary bits uh, for example, to start the video before the kernel starts the video and things like that. But I, this, we have a lot of hope now, which we haven't had for this level of hope for quite a while. So that's great. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that we have a fully free system, and yet users that make some sacrifices to commit to this kind of system are still being asked to run proprietary software every day when they use their computer. And that proprietary software is JavaScript. It's uh, when you visit. Just about any website now, you're served programs in the background, just like any other program that you're running on your computer. Those programs execute locally on your machine, and they are very often non-free software. So Richard Stallman, back in 2009, called this the JavaScript, JavaScript trap, um, and he was referring to an earlier uh, trap <laughs> called the Java trap. And the way he explained it is, your program, though in itself free, may be restricted by non-free software that it depends on, uh, since the problem is most prominent today for Java programs, we call it the Java trap. Well, now we have a similar kind of trap where even though you are using a free operating system and everything in front of you is free, you are ending up still running non-free programs and your computing life is depending still on non-free programs. So why is it a, a trap any more than any other um, programming language that can be used to produce non-free software? Well, it's because JavaScript is assumed. It's a fact of using the web now. and, and just to highlight an example of how much of a, a, an assumption and a necessary part of the web it is today, Mozilla recently uh, kind of hit the option to disable JavaScript in Firefox. And they, they did it, understandably, because users, including me embarrassingly enough, would turn off JavaScript, forget that they'd done it, um, and then wonder why Firefox wasn't working properly. Right? So to eliminate user confusion, they've moved it into a more advanced configuration area, and that to me is just an example of how necessary JavaScript has become uh, and how hard it is to avoid it. But we don't want to avoid all JavaScript. Right? We, we, we just want to avoid proprietary JavaScript. We have no particular aversion to one programming language. It's what's done with that programming language. JavaScript programs are almost always non-free, and I'm going to explain why, because there are some very popular free software JavaScript uh, programs, but I'll talk more about the ways in which it's actually distributed to you, make it non-free. 
this is also enabled by the fact that, um, at least anecdotally, you know, the license count numbers that you might see comparing the GPL to other licenses and permissive versus copyleft licenses, are those numbers are almost always based on horrible data. So if you see any of those, you should take them with a, a pound of salt. Um, but anecdotally, I think it's, it's not too much of a stretch to say that in the world of JavaScript, permissive licenses are, are a very common choice. So this kind of trap hurts. Um, and like any other non-free software, we shouldn't wait for proprietary software to burn us um, before we start working to get away from it. We have a, a very nice and a terrible way list of proprietary software abuses um, being accumulated on GNU.org. But just to make some specific points, we can highlight some of the ways that JavaScript is used to harm users, and specifically proprietary JavaScript. So harms that are done to users, which could have been avoided if the JavaScript were free. Uh, a very relatively popular one is modification of the copy and paste buffer. Um, you know, when you try to copy something out of your browser and paste it somewhere else. This uh, site you can visit has a nice little demonstration of that. Um, but, and it's, uh, it's harmless, but you can imagine a very harmful version where you copy something, you know, you're reading a page of technical instructions, let's say about how to uh, configure a piece of software and it tells you to type this into your shell. So you copy that command, you go to your shell, you paste it, hit return, and oh wait. <laughs> what just pasted into my shell was not what I copied off of the web page. What I just pasted was you know, a deletion command. What I was trying to copy was a git checkout command. Right? So JavaScript has the capability to modify what's in your copy buffer. You also see less sinister uses of this um, these days when you are, for example, copying a link to a new site article like the New York Times or some other place and you paste it. They have suddenly decided to start attaching little uh, attribution notices to the end of the links. So you, when you go to like a, post, uh, write a blog article about it, uh, a news article you read, and you paste the link in, you'll get an additional advertisement for whatever site you copied it from. So that's pretty dangerous and annoying. Uh, JavaScript's been used to block browser functions. Um, you don't see this quite as much anymore, but it's still out there. If you're visiting a site that has uh, somebody's photos or, and you try to right click to save that image to your hard drive, and this box pop up that says, you cannot violate my copyright. You know, that's sort of this JavaScript enabled DRM, which is easy to defeat when you just disable JavaScript. But since you don't want to, run, run, want to run around the web without JavaScript, it does become a little bit more annoying. Uh, JavaScript can record your keystrokes um, when you're typing in a text box and that, or filling out a form. And that obviously has a lot of useful applications, but you can imagine the many sinister things that could be done by a program whose source code you can't read and nobody else's, nobody else can read the source code and it has the power to record your keystrokes and do things with them. Um, that's not nice. So, oh, and it can be used to deliver actually very uh, powerful malware. There was a compromise in the in the Tor network. Um, well, a compromise directed at Tor users, I should say, uh, which involved the use of JavaScript. So, these things are true of any programming language, right? Um, you can have any programming language can do bad things to you. If the, if the source code is out there, then we have the ability to take a program and make a new version of it that doesn't do those bad things. So these abuses are always just. It's not that you couldn't implement free software to do this. You could, but someone else could come along and change it and take out that, uh, the negative feature, the anti-feature. And of course, there's also lots of benefits to having free JavaScript, just like there's benefits to having free programs in any other language. Uh, userscripts.org is a, a site that has uh, GreaseMonkey scripts that you can run in, um, in your browser to customize the behavior of various sites, you know, do things like enable you to download videos from uh, video streaming sites and, and that sort of thing. And this is kind of this was a big inspiration or a big kind of a, a reason for us to take a serious look at this problem because you can just get a taste of the types of things that you could do on a regular basis if your browser was set up to allow you to run your own JavaScript, your own modified JavaScript program in place of a JavaScript program that a server would normally ask you to run. So browse the site and you get some idea of the different types of things we could do if we had more freedom in this area. Now this site and Grease Monkey alone don't solve the problem because these scripts don't necessarily replace, they don't have the capability uh, to replace scripts that are being delivered to you as much as they can modify them um, afterward and change their behavior. So if you are living in a free world, you want the ability to actually 
stop a non-free thing from running entirely and replace it with your own free program, or even to stop a particular version of a free program from running and replace it with your own uh, free version or one that another person created for you. So the question is, what's needed to solve this problem? How do we make JavaScript free? How do we avoid those dangers that I highlighted and also get some of these benefits that are out there? So there's just a two-point basic checklist for freedom here. It's very simple for people that have gone over are familiar with licensing, but you just need to provide a license notice, right? Because if you don't do that, in most parts of the world, you are uh, a default copyright applies to the work and a copy of the free license. Now, not every license requires you to distribute a copy of it along with the software, but it's uh, in order to build an effective free community and encourage people to value their freedom, you kind of have to let them know that they have it. So that's an important element of distributing software that you want to be free, whether you're using the GPL or not. And then, of course, you have to provide the complete and corresponding source code. And, and this gets back to uh, uh, the permissive licensing question. A program may be licensed under uh, permissively to enable you to distribute it in binary-only form or in source code form, as you choose. But every, if you're distributing it as a binary, and not giving the person the source code, you are giving them a piece of proprietary software. right? You're, you're just giving them a binary. Just because that software is available somewhere else as free software, uh, that's not what you're giving them. So it's important when you're distributing the software, if you want it to be free, you need to convey the source code to the user. And the failure to do these two things is, is the reason why uh, most JavaScript in use today is not free. And it doesn't have to be that way. A lot of JavaScript could very easily be made free. So we have some obstacles to doing that. One is uh, my bandwidth is bigger than your freedom. Okay, um, JavaScript is you know the files are served uh, as you load a page, so the page needs to load quickly. You don't want to sit there and wait a long time. Um, people have to pay for their bandwidth when they're serving the site to you. So there's a big incentive to compress the JavaScript to make it smaller. And the process called minification. It's essentially you know a, a kind of compilation. It also means, of course, they don't want to give you a copy of the license every time they give you a file. That would be ridiculous um, to have to, to receive a copy of the GPL with each individual JavaScript file that um, was loaded on a page. That would actually add up to a significant amount of uh, bytes. So we're not asking people to do that. But we do need to look at this minified question. So minified JavaScript is not source code. Okay? Now, it's text. It's not like a, you know, it's not object code. It's not a binary in the same sense that a compiled C program is. But the definition of source code is the preferred form for modification. What does the programmer use uh, when they are working on the program? They do not work on the program in a minified fashion, just a taste for why. You know. And that's cut off because there's no line breaks, right? It just keeps going. Um, and you can see what, what's been done. You know, the variable names have been and function names have been reduced to letters. You know, sort of things that were um, in other forms, in other languages, are considered classic obfuscation techniques, are used in order to save um, bandwidth and, and speed things up. So this is not source code. Um, there are JavaScript files that are frequently served as source code. Um, JavaScript being a scripting language, you know, it's a very common format. But um, especially for larger sites, that's not the way you usually receive it. So the first step to fixing this problem is to provide the source code. Now, there's two ways to do it. You could just serve the source code. You know, honestly, all of our lives would be a lot easier if that happened in some ways. But um, failing that, you can add a comment to the minified file, which links people to the source code. Uh, and we have a, just a simple stylized comment format for that um, that people can follow. And then you also need to... and an important part of this, uh, I'm talking about this in general free software terms, but we did come to this problem, uh, to come to thinking about this problem also because we were trying to think through what does it mean to comply with the GPL when you're using JavaScript. You know, like I said, we wouldn't ask people to, um, to send a full copy of the source code with every minified JavaScript file. We wouldn't ask people to send a full copy of the GPL with every JavaScript file that's served. Um, so, the adding a comment like this, which directs people to the source code in a manner as described in the license itself. You have to make sure that that URL continues to exist, is available for as long as you distribute the minify version, et cetera, is a legitimate way to satisfy the source requirement. Sure. 
why does the GPL not require that you send a full copy of the GPL with every piece of minified JavaScript source code? Uh, we're getting to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is like, it's not, it's a good question because it's not entirely clear. You know, you have to think about things like what is the program? You know, are all of the scripts that are being uh, delivered and run all part of the same program? So, or package. So if you ship a package in a distribution that's licensed under the GPL, you don't have to include a, a copy of the GPL for every file that's in there. So part of this just comes back to the question of what's the work? Um, but we also have a, another proposal to link up the copy of the license to the um, code itself. So you also need to provide a free license notice, um, even when it's minified. Well, one way to convey the license information, even with a minified file, is just to tack a comment on to the top of the minified file, which has the, uh, uh, the license notice that you would normally use in a program to say it's licensed under the GPL or it's licensed under another um, free license. So is this um, suggestion to the word, you know, dot, 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 that it would have, in the G case of GPL, the, like, suggested yeah. notice? Mm -hmm. So I'd imagine, and I'm not a developer, that if, you know, num if, if you're already doing this minified, you know, the number of character is, is a, you know, that's a very long notice. Yeah. W do you think, would you... Do you think that for GPL compliance purposes, a shorter version of that would be? So I have another version to show you, um, which is a different approach and, and one that we actually like better for <coughs> similar reasons. Um, there is a note that one sort of easy way um, to deal with all this, if you are the copyright holder uh, for the JavaScript program, you can actually add an exception or an additional permission, which GPL version 3 allows you to do. It's described in section 7. And that permission can say you may distribute uh, minimized or compacted forms of this code without the copy of the GPL normally required, um, provided you include this notice and a URL which links to the corresponding source code. So if you're the copyright holder, you can essentially say, this is a JavaScript program. I'm not expecting you to provide a copy of the GPL with uh, every time you serve it, as long as you include this notice and as long as you are actually distributing the source code um, when it's uh, minified. But you're probably not the copyright holder. So we need to talk about other solutions. So we have a, a format called JavaScript Web Labels. Uh, it's a structured format to consistently, conveniently convey, uh, sorry, both a copy of the license and the corresponding source code at the same time uh, without some of the drawbacks that, that we've highlighted here. And the description is online at gnu.org of the format. Um, and the announcement was actually made uh, back in 2012. So the goal of this format is to be machine readable, to provide machine readable uh, information about the licensing of JavaScript served by a site. But it is also really intended to be human readable because it's the human in the end who needs to know what the license is and needs to know where to get the source code from. So we think we're going to accomplish both goals, but if it comes down to it, you know, Sending somebody a copy of the GPL is not just a, a perfunct, uh, perfunctory act of compliance. It has a purpose, which is to communicate to users what their rights are when they use the software. So it's important to us that it has that human element and not just be um, a machine-driven thing. So the way this format starts out, I'm just going to walk through it. In the footer of your website, you have a link which says, say, JavaScript licenses just like you might have a link for other copyright information um, on the bottom of your site. And this is the footer at fsf.org. Under the hood, um, that could look something like this. The important part is that it has this uh, REL element to it, because that's part of what enables it to be a machine-readable format. And then that link goes to a page that looks something like this, but it could be prettier if you so desired. Um, this is the human readable version of it, right? So we have three columns here. The first column is the uh, name of the script as it's being served to the user. So these are all of the scripts that are served to a user of fsf.org in different cases. So this would usually be your, uh, your minified version on the left here, if you have a, a minified script. In the middle, you have the licensing information, so a link to the license. 
you can have multiple license. So a jQuery uh, is licensed under both the expat license and the GPL. Uh, so you can list dual license items. And then the right-hand column is the source code. So that's the unminified version. That's, uh, so you can see, if you're a user, you're looking for the source code, you just find the minified file name in the left column, you see what the license is, and then you find the source code. And this is just a, uh, an HTML table, uh, a row of it, or a very simple version of the table can look like this. Um, the important part is the ID of the table in order to be machine read, a machine readable way. And then the rest of it is just the HTML for what I explained. The licensing link in the middle here can also uh, be a magnet link, which I'll explain in, in a minute. But a magnet link being a, a, a URI that identifies a resource on the web by its metadata rather than a specific URL. Uh, so that's a little bit you know, more resilient than pointing to a copy of a, a license on a specific server. Uh, there are some, I've been showing you the FSF's web labels, but there are some cases of this in the wild. Uh, EFF has been experimenting with it, so this is uh, their version of the web label. Looks a little nicer. Uh, so I mentioned, I've been talking about how we want this to be automated, and some of those, I highlighted some of the particular things about the format that are there for that purpose. Uh, so where does the automation come in? Uh, right now, we have a, a piece of software called Libra.js. Sure. So, um, you said that it was supposed to be machine readable. Let's yeah. say the EFF on the right has C below, which presumably is not a machine readable way of... Yeah, uh, well, machine can't figure that out, right? Our, the format is very... Everything in the right-hand column is going to be interpreted as uh, the source link by the machine. So. Right. Uh, if a machine actually followed that C below link, they probably wouldn't find the source of the thing on the left. Would they? Well, it would, because this is the, the, the screwed up part here is the human readable portion, the C below. The, the HTML underneath this, I checked, oh. does point to the right place. So I don't really understand. I think maybe you can see by these file names, I suspect they're doing this in some kind of automated fashion um, to catalog their scripts. And But if you also go lower, they do have non-C below entries down there. So my other question is, if a machine is trying to decide whether or not to run some JavaScript based yeah. on this information, how do they, it seems to me like they would have to be able to interpret the URLs in the middle license column and know whether those URLs led to free licenses yeah. or not. That's correct. So if you're hosting your own copy of the GPLv3, you would have to download it and see if it figured out it was the GPLv3 and that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, that's correct. And I think that's a, that's a strength. That, yeah, that's a strength of the magnet link, I think, is, um, as a way to partially solve that problem. Uh, so Libre.js is a browser extension that you can use um, for Mozilla-based browser. And it's like a new project. And it actually looks, checks when you, when you turn it on. It looks at every site that you visit. And it checks the JavaScript. And it looks for any of those methods that I've described so far. So it checks for a license notice in the JavaScript files themselves. It checks for. Uh, a web label page, and then it tries to evaluate and see which scripts are free, which scripts are not, and it gives you a report. Um, by default right now, it also actually block all of the non-free scripts and allow the free ones. Uh, they're actually adding a mode to it now so that you can just have a warning as opposed to outright blocking all of the non-free scripts, um, because what we found very quickly is that this is... Um, you know, in the end, it ends up right now, it's essentially a way to turn off JavaScript on the web, <laughs> uh, which is not what we want it to be. Um, we want it to be a way to selectively enable JavaScript on the web. So, uh, but I think it's important for people to, to try it out, to start using it, uh, to do the usual thing of, of reporting bugs with it and seeing how the experience works for you, but also just to kind of, you know, open eyes a bit to what the problem is here. There is a, another aspect to this, which is, like I said, a lot. Of the reason a lot of JavaScript is non-free currently isn't because it has to be that way. It's because it's just not clearly flagged as being free. But in fact, if you were to go to this Git repository over here, you could get the very same software as free software. So when you visit a site with Libre.js, it's not really, and, and there are a lot of scripts blocked, it's not really appropriate to um, go burn down the webmaster's house because they're distributing non-free software. Um, what's appropriate is to have a conversation about um, it looks like you're trying to distribute, uh, it looks like you are um, 
you understand free software and you're trying to use jQuery and other free software JavaScript libraries, uh, it would be really helpful if you would explicitly say that in those files so that people were aware that you were using free software. Um, it's that conversation that needs to be had more than the, uh, the critical, the super critical approach right now. Of course, as soon as you start, you know, talking to people about this, there's there's lots of ideas for how this could be done. So, we're often asked, you know, why why do you do it some other way uh, than the way LibreJS does it? You know, why this particular web label format? And we're not actually committed to doing it only this way. You know, what we care about at the FSF is actually the problem itself. You know, we need a way to be able to uh, get free JavaScript and not not free JavaScript, and we need a way to be able to distribute copyleft JavaScript. So anything that satisfies those conditions, we're interested in talking about. And there have been other um, conversations. People have suggested using HTTP headers to convey JavaScript licensing information. Uh, people have suggested using RDF. You know, some people aren't a huge fan of the kind of structured HTML table approach. It's you know, a little bit arbitrary. Uh, so all these things can happen. And what's more, there doesn't necessarily have to be just one way of doing it. LibreJS is written so that it can actually add you know, other methods of verification. So if there was another one that got some traction, like HTTP headers, then that could be rolled into the plugin as well. So uh, I mean, we're interested in hearing feedback and criticism and, and suggestions about this format, but it's also not from the standpoint of, of wanting this to be the only way. So beyond that, you know, how do we get this trap actually closed? So the Java trap uh, was, in the end, solved by a combination of really hard work by free software hackers to write free versions of the Java um, platform. Uh, and then, partly because of that, uh, Sun did the right thing and, and relicensed the platform under a free software license. So yeah, the analogy, you know, in this case, we're closing the JavaScript trap. Uh, we need to um, convince our browser makers uh, that this is an important thing, that as part of their general mission to protect their users' privacy, security, and freedom, um, that this is something that they should try to enable, whether it's incorporating LibreJS or that exact method is a different question, but incorporating some way for users to deal with this threat would be a, a huge help toward closing the trap. Um, and we need people to uh, help, for one thing, just fix the JavaScript that is already free and just not labeled that way. Um, we need people to write free software JavaScript and we need to convince people to use the free software JavaScript. Some specific next steps that we have in software terms, there's many improvements that can be made to LibreJS. Uh, it can get faster, it can have a nicer interface, um, it can enable different kinds of whitelisting, there's lots of things that can happen with it. It's a very new project, uh, and so there's a lot of opportunities to get involved with it. Uh, we need it for mobile devices. I've just been talking generically, but um, JavaScript on a mobile device is the same thing as JavaScript on the computer, but the programming for the you know extension and manner of dealing with it might need to be a bit different. Uh, we really want a command line and automated version of LibreJS. So you can imagine if you're a webmaster, um, you know a big a big difficulty in dealing with all this is the way that certain um, web publication systems deliver JavaScript. They can grab scripts from all over the place and stick them all in one file and then serve that to you. Uh, and as a webmaster, it can get pretty maddening to try to make sure you um, are doing the right thing all of the time. So we really need a, an automated version. LibreJS is a browser extension that you have to manually run. You know, it's meant to, to work for a live, breathing user. So something that can be run as, as part of a regular you know, system check job, alert system, that would monitor and um, do essentially the same function as LibreJS. Uh, we could modify uh, minifiers that are used commonly in the JavaScript community to output the right kinds of copyright notices by default uh, and take some of the, the legwork out of it for people. Um, you know, people have done this historically with the GPL notices and anything that you can do that makes uh, this type of, you know, kind of, it's not bureaucratic in the end, but it feels like that when you're a programmer. Um, to make that easier for people, I think, would be a big help. Uh, and then there are many patches to be submitted to upstream free software projects that uh, have JavaScript as a, as a part of them. And we had a conversation at, at dinner last night about how you know kind of a, a good starter bug for new people getting involved in kernel development or in, in other kinds of projects is to correct the FSF's address 
in the license notices. You know, uh, if any of you think we're still at Temple Place, you know, don't try to visit us. Cause we're not there anymore. Uh, not for a while. So um, fixing a, a little bug like that is actually a, a nice way for someone just to learn how to check out the repository, you know, make the changes, commit them back, and just learn the whole procedures of participating in the project and do something that's a little bit useful at the same time. So to me, this is a very parallel kind of thing. There are lots of these, all these projects out there that are free software, you know, MediaWiki, Etherpad, uh, that you can go and they want to be free software. They're intending to be free software. And you can just submit some patches to help make that more explicit. From a public awareness standpoint, um, I already touched on this, but we have an ongoing campaign to raise this issue with uh, webmasters to get them of particular sites. You know, it's kind of, um, it's kind of like, a, it's, it's not a winning approach in the long term to try to pick one site at a time to talk to, to fix. But, you know, as you do that, you, you build awareness about the problem and you um, get some more allies on board um, and you just start to make this world an actual reality. So on fsf.org, we, we've been highlighting one site a month um, uh, since uh, mid last year for people to talk to and, and try to convince. And we're currently working with greenpeace.org. It was just one of the sites that was picked by uh, people participating in the action. And Greenpeace is currently going through their, their main sites and updating the JavaScript licensing information, making sure it's all free. And they're also discussing possible new internal standards for you know, all of the satellite-related organizations to make sure that those do the right thing. So this was, uh, you know, it's always nice to have a success like that. And, uh, and I hope it gives everybody encouragement that you're not just going to get you know, shooed away. Um, people out there, actually, if you approach them um, in a friendly way, do want to have their site be accessible to as many of their supporters as possible and are willing to do some work to get that done. We're also currently trying to work with reddit.com. Um, that's uh, the latest one, so they haven't responded yet, but you can help by uh, sending them a comment and trying to bring it to their attention, to the Reddit admins. Reddit is an example of a project that does publish um, its source code to a large extent under a free license. So you know you, they probably do want to support um, uh, fully free JavaScript. And we have a, uh, if you are a JavaScript developer, um, we have a, we could really use your help right now. We have a task force, um, which is a small group of people that know a lot about JavaScript development. You can just email our campaigns address and we'll get you hooked up with that. And so essentially we have a list that the task force members are on and, and that's some place that like the Greenpeace folks can write to um, to get help trying to figure out where exactly the problems are. And we want to offer that as a, a service essentially to anybody that we're also, you know, trying to, to get to um, distribute free JavaScript. It's also a place where some LibreJS um, improvements can be discussed, so there's a, officially a separate mailing list for LibreJS specifically when it gets to that level, but um, this task force list is a good place to bridge the gap from user freedom concerns to what might be implemented in software. And of course, you know, submit some patches yourself if you can. Um, spend a little time learning how it works. If you run a site, then you know, try to fix up the JavaScript. And you know, to be clear, what we're trying to do here is to get sites to work without requiring non-free JavaScript. That's one of our main goals. So we want free software users to be able to effectively live on the internet um, and not have to run non-free software. So that means we're not, in this campaign, really taking on things like Google Analytics uh, head on. We probably will in a different way. Uh, but because Google Analytics is not a required piece of software to use a site, it's just a piece of proprietary JavaScript that gives the site owner some information about you. So LibreJS will just block that because it's not free and you don't have to worry about it. But it's not a, a victory condition or a success condition for us in this campaign to convince everybody to stop using that. We want to make sure that core functions, that the things you actually need to do to use your bank account, to you know, collaboratively draft text with people, uh, whatever you can do with all free software for the same reasons that you've always wanted to do it on the computer that you have in front of you. Uh, I'm happy to, to take some questions and hear people's ideas about this uh, and uh, anything else related to the FSF actually, but I'd like to focus on this. Tom. So um, you've got a lot of really interesting metadata there. Have you considered adding uh, a cryptographic signature to JS file? Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, uh, no. Um, but that's, uh, that, 
I guess that kind of reproducible builds idea sort of of connecting the minified JavaScript officially to the source would it would be a good idea. I have a feeling it's probably a lot simpler in that case to do that since minification is done by a set of standard tools. But yeah, that's a that's a very good idea. In the back. Yeah, like I, yeah. I couldn't hear it. Dennis, could you repeat that? Uh, I said that since the JavaScript is the software, you could run it also locally because the new website like the Yeah, that's a good point that this if we if we really have a, a free JavaScript world then you can you, you run the JavaScripts from your own machine and you don't have to worry about them being served to you by somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, have you contacted or done any work with the W3C to try to get additional attributes added to script tags since that's really where this belongs anyway? Yeah, um, I don't know if we've asked about that specifically. We did ask about the uh, REL attribute because that's currently not a valid one. Um, but that's a good idea also. Because that would also then lead through a route to inline scripts, which uh -huh. all the stuff you've talked about here wouldn't address at all. Yeah, I, I didn't I wasn't clear about that. So for inline scripts, what we what we're asking people to do is to put the license notice um, in the HTML to cover all the scripts on this page. Uh, but it that's not yeah, that could be better because you can have scripts with different licenses on the right, same page. Right, and, right. Yeah. There, there may technically be an official way of defining rel and rel. Um, values, but in practice, people just make them up and document them on the microformats wiki. Yeah. So I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah, we just we don't want, want the validator to keep telling everybody it's an error. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, right. Also, you, if you wanted an additional thing with a script tag, you can now use data hyphen anything. That's in HTML5, mm -hmm. and validators will ignore attributes called data hyphen anything. So you, that allows you to add arbitrary data to nodes in HTML to make it more semantic. So you could adopt a convention for that if you wanted to add stuff to script text. Um, I, I think that the, the way that you're going to succeed here is by making it easier for webmasters, and every way you can make it easier is going to make it more likely. So I was wondering, is there also scope for a, a different method in a notification which is essentially convention-based? So it's just a, a meta tag in the page says, I subscribe to the convention, where the convention is that if you take any of my JavaScript URLs and remove min dot from near the end, you will find the unminified form of the JavaScript, which will have within it the licensing information for that JavaScript. Yeah. So when you're on my site, all you have to do is make that edit to all the JavaScript URLs programmatically, and the site will run a little bit slower, and, but you will, every time you get a JavaScript file, you'll get licensing information with it, and you will decide whether to run it or not. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that they would just have to tweak their build process slightly to make sure those files work with their head. Yeah. And sometimes they are anyway, because that's how the next files work. Yeah. And then just add one meta tag to their page. They wouldn't have to keep and maintain a whole table of right. So that's another way. You can do it. Yeah, I think I think that makes makes a lot of sense. And and you know, like we're generating our that web labels table is is generated by a script, um, and I, that's what I expect. In order for that to be feasible, that's kind of what has to happen. You can't really expect someone to you know, manually maintaining a table at a large site um, of that size would is pretty overwhelming. So I think that kind of pattern just makes that job a lot easier because. Just take out the minification extension and you're good. Have you come across SPDX? Yes. So they do machine readable license information. Some of their standards may be useful in defining your standards for how you define the license of the JavaScript file. Yeah, it would be nice if we could make these you know, multiple efforts at machine readable license information all kind of converge. Um, but uh, you know, I could see uh, I could see adding a, a layer to LibreJS, for example, that would check for that if someone developed a system based on that. I don't know uh, if we would. So we want our uh, list of licenses to be all free licenses. And I know the XP, SPDX has some that are not free licenses by either OSI or FSF's standard. So there's some yeah, issues yeah, like that to sort out. But the. Yeah. But you can use the short identifiers from the SPDX license list as a. As right. A, as a, uh, yeah, but we really like the magnet links idea too. So it'd be nice if maybe like uh, those two things could maybe come together. Yep, one more, I think. You got ten minutes. I have ten minutes. Oh.
<laughs> oh yeah, this was my presentation clock where I was stopping time for questions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, yeah, yes and no, right? I mean, so this is true. For one thing, this is a piece that needs to be written. So we need software which will actually enable you, similar to Grease Monkey, but at a lower level to uh, replace one particular script with another script. Like, that's the uh, first step. And then after that, uh, there is the world as it is right now, and there is the world as it could be. So the world as it is right now, yes, people play you know, pretty fast and loose with their JavaScript files because nobody else, it's a private API essentially, right? So they don't have to worry about anybody else talking to it. But that, it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually imagine um, if this were to become a thing online where people could run their own JavaScript files, then that would change site behavior back in the other way. Uh, but I also think that there is more standard JavaScript out there than, than a lot of people think. I think that uh, even something which could just recognize very commonly used scripts and substitute them with something else would could accomplish some pretty cool things. Um, people have, you know, Grease Monkey scripts to do things with Gmail and Google Docs, uh, for example. There's other problems with using some of those things, but um, I think they still provide proof of concept that you can. The APIs and things don't change so often that it's useless. It's just breakage that you have to deal with sometimes until uh, people come around and start actually supporting that behavior. Um, how can you ensure that uh, what you think is free is really free? Because I could take a piece of uh, source code and run it and uh, declare it's free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can happen in any kind of free software. Um, ultimately, you have to decide if you trust the person that's uh, telling you what the license is and whether there's an incentive for them to try to deceive you. Um, and there's uh, that's not something I don't think that's unique to the JavaScript problem. Um, that's just a problem with licensing of things in general. Uh, it would be nice if you know if everything were free software, we wouldn't have to worry about such problems. Repeat that, please. How do you handle it? Uh, with a very old screensaver. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as a as a sponsor for our projects, we, we handle it by having people, um, in a lot of cases, sign an agreement to us that what they're contributing to our projects, they have the uh, right to contribute, and that they can legally give it to us as free software, and we can legally redistribute it as free software. Um, otherwise, this is a, a part in the a part, um, at least in the United States, of the DMCA, which is you know not necessarily a bad thing. Unlike the circumvention provisions, which is that if you are hosting material um, and you believe that you have the right to host that material, and then the copyright holder comes along and says you don't, then there's just a set of standards you comply with to remove it or to contest it. And as long as you do that, then there's there's not a penalty to you. So that's one way that. You could deal with people you know, lying about licensing information or getting it wrong. Yeah. So the LibreJS itself, um, for the human readable part, no, there's not a, a standard. Um, but the, human re the machine readable part, uh, LibreJS looks for particular links right now. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Right, so the, the question is um, how do you deal with the fact that people call the same license by different names, um, is what it boils down to. And I think that's a problem in free software licensing. And that's things like SPDX or. Uh, other projects have, are trying to standardize those names. Um, we're not going to try to do that within the web labels format itself. Well, that's I think a problem to be solved elsewhere, but it is an issue. You know, we people can get legitimately confused by um, names being used uh, loosely. You got five minutes. Okay.
very impressive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think we could definitely use it if, if one exists. Um, but I think the right place to define that and come to agreement on that is not within the web labels specification in particular, but I think it is something that's needed, yeah. Uh, there you go. Why does JavaScript? Why just the JavaScript part of the web page? Because the application also includes HTML and CSS. Right. Um, the primary reason is because JavaScript is HTML and CSS aren't uh, functional software in the same way as a JavaScript program in terms of what they can do on your machine um, and in terms of the implications that has for your freedom. Uh, we do uh, always campaign to have um, documentation and functional educational information be under a fully free license that um, permits people to modify it and improve it just like software. So, you know, that is an issue we could make a bigger um, campaign out of. That's just not, it's a separate issue, I think, because it's more about, um, it's a different kind of work than a, an actual program running on your machine. Sure. It was almost the same in that where is the line between data and code? Like, if it's not part of the goal for the SFF to have every bit of HTML you download be free, although it might be, it might be nice, yeah. then you get to CSS, which has some programming language like constructs in it and has acquired more capabilities over time, and then you get to JavaScript dash more, but is yet still sandboxed, if you like. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have full control over your machine, modular bugs and the engine the sandbox. Right? So, at what point do you say, okay, this is sufficiently code-like that I want to only execute free of it, free stuff of it? Yeah, well, I mean, it's one, there is actually a definition in the article of what constitutes, for example, trivial JavaScript versus non-trivial JavaScript, and um, uh, it's the non-trivial JavaScript that we want to make sure is freely licensed, and that um, rule of thumb right now is whether it defines a function. Um, that's kind of a, a way that you can usefully identify it, but part of this is also a judgment call about how um, particular things are playing out in the life of a typical computer user, and people's freedoms are being pretty seriously threatened by proprietary JavaScript on the web in a way that's not true yet um, in our judgment uh, in these other ways, which is not to say that we won't care about them or don't care about them, but for focus purposes, you know, I'm not sure there's like a bright line that would, I, I think what you're saying is the standard that as it gets closer to um, being a, a program that you would that you need to be able to modify and that you need to be able to dictate how it runs, then that's the closer it gets to being an issue. Mm -hmm. So um, this kind of hooks into this, uh, and is there beyond the, the article that was uh, you, uh, linked, I guess, in your presentation, <laughs> um, uh, a new licensing guideline? Like the, for the GPL, there's uh, a nice document on the uh, FSF's website about uh, if your code is less than this size, then please don't bother with the GPL to do this. And there's a fairly sort of easy way of figuring out what to do. Yeah, um, we the the little snippets that I showed are from uh, a larger article. So the JavaScript article itself has an appendix. JavaScript trap article itself has an appendix at the end that has similar how-to information. And then the web labels uh, article was pretty step by step for doing it. Um, and then for the reasoning, there's a third article, the rationale to explain some of the deeper reasoning behind it. But yeah, it's, um, I would say the closest thing to the GPL instructions is what's at the bottom of the JavaScript trap article. Pretty similar. Okay, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you, John. Thank you.